everyone. I'm Adrian from Audio Excellence in Canada. I uh, just wanted to let you know that, uh, well, there's something very interesting. Macintosh will be releasing uh, something today, but I'll talk about that just in a bit. First, let me talk about why it's going to be released. Um, you've all heard about the idea of uh, by wiring. So if you look at your speakers in the back, you will see that there are typically at least uh, two pairs of binding posts. Typically, some only have one pair, but many do have two pairs. So you have one set at the top that's often um, marked as mids and highs, and then you have one that's marked base. So um, most of the speakers come with um, shorting straps. So if you only have one speaker wire, uh, one set of speaker wires, you just connect it to either one set and it works. If you have a speaker wire that uh, has bi-wiring capability, you can hook up a set to the base and another set to the mids and the highs. In bi-amping, what you're actually doing is you're getting a set of amplifiers or one amplifier to drive the mids and the highs and another amplifier to drive the base. Now, why would you want to do bi-amping? Well, first let's talk about um, the benefits of bi-amping. Um, when you bi-amp, if it's done properly, you have direct power going straight to the mids and the highs and a separate a power amplifier going to the base. Um, this will oftentimes give you better results if it's done correctly. Problem is, it's complicated. It's not so simple as to just get uh, uh, an amplifier just to drive the bays and another one to drive the mids and the highs. Um, oftentimes you will see people recommending let's use tubes to drive the mids and the highs and solid state to drive the bays. Why would you do that? Well, starting with tube amplifiers, tubes in general have a really nice magical quality in the mid-range, uh, very smooth, the highs are very sweet. Um, when you play them loud, they don't tend to clip harsh. They, they tend to clip softer. And, and so yeah, when you play them loud, they don't uh, um, sound bright as much as, let's say, a solid state amplifier that's clipping. However, tube amplifiers are not known for their bass. Their, their bass is generally uh, um, uh, looser, not, not grippy, not tight, and not very controlled. Um, conversely, solid state amplifiers are great in the bass, uh, good ones anyway. Um, they're tighter, more resolving, you hear the bass notes better. Um, arguably mid-range and high frequencies, maybe not quite as uh, um, beautiful, not quite as organic as tube amps. And so the logical idea is, well, let's use tubes to drive the mids and the highs and solid states to drive the bass. Um, there are a few things to be concerned about. Uh, first, to do biamping properly, you do need to make sure that the uh, tube amplifier has uh, somewhat similar power to the base amplifier. Now, there's a general rule of thumb that if your tube amplifier is roughly half of the solid state's amplifier, you should be okay. So, for example, let's say the amplifier, the solid state amp is 200 watts per channel. Um, the tube amplifier, if it's rated at 100, real legitimate 100 watts, it should work. So here's an example of what I mean by bi-amping. This is one of Macintosh's most popular amplifiers. It's called the MC275. It's been made since the 70s, believe it or not. This is the sixth generation. So uh, um, what you could do is uh, use this tube amplifier to drive the mids and highs of a pair of speakers. And then as an example, a solid state amplifier like this D'Agostino to drive the bass. Now, here's why you wouldn't want to do it in this case. This amplifier is rated for 75 watts only. This amplifier is rated, I think, for 500 watts. It's a, it's a big mismatch. Um, uh, especially if you like to play your music at high levels from time to time, which I do. So you'd want to use the rule of thumb and say, okay, if this is 500 watts and this is what you've got, you want to try and find a tube amplifier that's rated at least 250 watts per channel. That's the first thing. The second thing is that you do have to make sure that both amplifiers have the same input sensitivity. Uh, what do I mean by that? Let's say you put a one kilohertz uh, tone into the uh, um, tube amplifier and you get a certain output. 
you should do the same thing for the solid state and hopefully get identical results. Otherwise, what will happen is that, let's say for example, the amplifier is more sensitive. Um, the bass will be louder than the uh, tube amplifier. Conversely, if the tube amplifier is more sensitive, then the bass is softer and not quite as uh, powerful. Um, so you do have to make sure that the input sen sensitivities are the same. So if uh, uh, I put a, a one uh, kilohertz signal into this amplifier, I want to measure a certain amount of voltage coming out, and I want to make sure that the, the, the measurements are as close as possible to the solid state amplifier. If they are vastly different, uh, I would not recommend using that uh, because the uh, output imbalance uh, out of your speakers will be uh, very significant. If they're within a small amount, you're probably okay. The other thing to be concerned about is that um, ideally you want uh, an electronic crossover so that you can adjust the gain. So even though the, the sensitivities are matched, sometimes you still want to be able to adjust the volume settings a little bit for the mids and the highs separately from the bass. Uh, adjust it according to, let's say, your own uh, taste. And then finally, an electronic crossover allows you to set the uh, frequency at which the tube amplifier takes over uh, versus the solid state amplifier. So those are some uh, thoughts to be aware of when it comes to biamping. So it sounds like it's a lot of work, and it is. It, it, the end result can be really uh, very, very good. Um, I'll tell you some. Uh, tell you one example where it didn't work, and then recently some ones that have. Um, many years ago, uh, uh, when I was uh, selling Apogees, uh, we sold a pair of Apogee Divas to a client, and he loved the idea of biamping. And he had a pair of Conrad Johnson Premier Fives, I think, and he decided to buy a Krell amplifier to drive the the base panel, and the Apogee Diva had the optional uh, DAX uh, electronic crossover, so this way we could feed uh, the input signal from the preamplifier and then output uh, the bass to the Krells and the mids and the highs to the Conrad Johnson. Um, and with the DAX crossover, we could adjust the volume for uh, um, both the bass and the mids and highs separately and uh, also adjust the crossover frequency somewhat, if I remember correctly. The end result was okay. Problem was that the CJ clipped fairly easily. It, it, it um, could not play uh, at the volume that he liked and also, I think, had a hard time driving the uh, uh, speakers, uh, um, sensitivity as well as the impedance well, whereas the Krell had no problem whatsoever. So ultimately, that didn't work very well. Uh, conversely, one of the speakers that uh, we sell, um, uh, Legacy Audio, um, they have speakers such as the Aries where the bass uh, part of the speaker comes with its own dedicated uh, solid state power amplifier. So all you have to do is supply um, your own pre uh, power amplifier. And a number of our clients are using tube amps and they work marvelously well. Once set up properly, it can work really, really well. So. Um, coming back to today's topic specifically, Macintosh just introduced uh, an amplifier called the MC901, which is basically two amplifiers in one chassis. Now, first of all, it's a monoblock. So within each chassis, you actually have two amplifiers, a 300-watt tube amplifier and a 600-watt solid-state amplifier, all in one chassis. Um, the 300-watt tube amplifier is based on the MC2301, one of my favorite tube amplifiers, and the solid-state part, the 600-watt, is based on the MC611, which is a new monoblock amplifier that Macintosh put out a few months ago. Um, this product is new. Uh, um, by the time you see this video, Macintosh will have officially released um, news about this amplifier. So again, it's a monoblock and it's physically huge. Imagine 17 and a half inches wide. So the standard width of a Macintosh amplifier by approximately 13 and a half inches tall and almost 30 inches deep at 170 pounds. It's a huge amplifier. Um, and um, Macintosh says they'll be shipping um, 
sometime this month. We're excited. I've already ordered from uh, our pair, and we'll definitely give you our feedback once it arrives. Um, a few other things about this amplifier. Because it's two amplifiers in one, you can now use that amplifier to bi-amp your speakers easily because everything is, is, is matched perfectly. The, even the tonal balance is matched from the factory. Um, the, the sensitivities are matched, so there's no adjustments needed. Although, apparently on the amplifier, there will be gain adjustments from up to minus 6 dB to plus 3 dB, so you can adjust it to taste. Um, it also has um, uh, uh, frequency adjustments um, so that you can set the uh, um, uh, the frequency at which, the crossover frequency at which uh, the amplifiers uh, go to your speaker. Um, the other thing also to note is that because there are two completely separate amplifiers, you could in fact run two separate speakers entirely differently. So for example, if you have two sets of speakers, you could run the 600 watt solid state amplifier into one pair of speakers and the 300 watt uh, tube amplifier into uh, another set of speakers. So you could also do that. I don't have a lot of details on the amplifier quite as yet because they have not yet been released. Uh, but based on what I know from Macintosh, they don't um, tend to release products willy-nilly. They think about it for quite a while, long time. They do a lot of research, engineering, and development before they finally release it. And that's why Macintosh has a really good reputation for reliability and uh, producing products that people really want. Um, I think that covers everything I want. Oh, and pricing. I believe it is 35,000 US dollars for the pair, um, whatever that works out into Canadian dollars. And, um, oh, um, one more thing, um, uh, two more things I should say. Um, unique to this product is Macintosh's um, a monitoring system to monitor the screen grids of the tubes, the output tubes. So that uh, uh, ensures that the tubes are always run within their comfort level. If um, the, the tubes are being run really, really hard, there's a circuit within the amplifier that will um, take down the, the input to the current to the tube, the screen grid, so that it's protecting the tubes uh, um, and ensuring that the tubes last longer. Um, and then the other thing that's also very cool is that on this amplifier, you will see that there are uh, there's one meter, but it's actually two. It's stacked one on top of the other, and they're working independently. So one meter uh, um, is rated up to 300 watts, that's for the tube part, and then the other one's for 600 watts. All I've seen are pictures so far. Jay will uh, make sure to uh, uh, include pictures so you can see it in this video. And, um, and again, we'll make sure that we um, give you further details once we get our amplifiers. Anyway, thanks very much for watching this video. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, or thoughts, please leave them uh, at the bottom. And as always, if you like this video, subscribe and uh, turn on the notification. Okay, thanks very much. Take care. Bye-bye.